Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. It's been a while since I've uh, uploaded any videos. I had some prior ob obligations that took me away from my lecture series, but those obligations have been satisfied, and I am returning to my lecture series. In particular, this one is on epistemology. This is the anthology. If you want to get a copy of the book, just click the first video in the link, and it will take you to... It'll take you to the, uh, to the book. So buy the book, follow along. As always, the lecture series is always a supplement to existing reading, existing knowledge, to your notes. It's an additional source for you to gather more information and uh, a conceptually more rigorous interpretation from uh, a professional PhD um, credentialed in the field of philosophy. So uh, again, this is my attempt to offer a little bit of enlightenment to the world for free. As you guys know, the lecture series notes are always available. Click the link in the description field. It'll take you to the PDF. I just updated it. Today we're going to be looking at section 1.3 of the analysis. And uh, with that, let's begin. So this is uh, epistemology. This is epistemology, and we're going to be looking at, I'm dropping everything today. We're going to be looking at section 1.3. Let's look at section 1.3. Okay. Um, the first thing that I want to address, we're still analyzing, I don't know how many hours we're into the lecture series, a few hours into the epistemology series, but we're still looking at the first article, um, which is Barry Stroud's analysis of um, Descartes' um, meditations. So that's what we'll be doing. The thing that I want to say in this video is that I'm not particularly going to be itemizing list by list by list, detail by detail, concept by concept, Stroud's analysis of um, Descartes' meditations. If you want to have a rigorous conceptual understanding of that, read the meditations yourself. I'm not going to go through um, blow by blow what the process of methodological skepticism is. I'm not going to go through blow by blow how Descartes justifies and legitimizes the gradual sort of denial, if you will, of the external world. I'm not going to talk about the uh, cogito. I'm not going to talk about any of that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take um, Stroud's analysis of Descartes' methodological skeptical process and distill from that concepts that we can apply generally to epistemology and the understanding of epistemology. Again, this is a very, very introductory, well, I can't really say it's very introductory because some of the concepts here um, that I will address are a bit more advanced depending on what level you can um, perceive the relevance. But the idea is I want this to be an introductory account of epistemology. So I'm not going to go too deep, but I'm also not going to keep it um, too, too, too shallow, right? Okay, so um, just to begin, I will not directly assess the Cartesian process in this section. I will address important epistemological tools derived from Stroud's article. So that's the first bit of the disclaimer. We'll go through the article. You can follow along if you have the notes. Uh, not the notes, if you have the book. Just follow along, and you'll see what parts stood out to me. You'll also see the context in which Stroud uses that concept to analyze Descartes' meditations, and then you can make your own assessments, right? So the first bullet point, right? First bullet point. This is a direct quote from the text. Quote, what is true of a representative, uh, and before we begin, the, the title of this is generalizations from class-based representations. It's a mouthful. I'll explain in a little bit exactly what that means. But what we're attempting to look at in this section of my analysis are the conceptual epistemological means with which an individual generalizes from a particular um, a particular instantiation, which is usually taboo. So we're going to be looking at how and if that can be done or not done effectively. Okay, so to begin, first bullet point. What is true of a representative case if it is truly representative and does not depend on special particularities of its own? So if we're talking about a representative case, you're doing for example, um, I've done a very lengthy qualitative methods analysis lecture series, probably 12, 13 hour 
um, qualitative analysis lecture series, which I'm also going to extend into a part two, but I'll do that later. Um, one of the things that we look at is case-based research, right? Sort of like case-based, evidential-based research. The point is, what is true of a representative case? This obviously holds um, in terms of legal theory, right? Legal scholars use precedence, so that precedence serves the same conceptual. Now, I'm taking uh, obviously you see I've immediately taken this well outside of Stroud and Descartes, but the idea is we can use the book as a guide to do two things. One, understand the historical relevance and historical critique and analysis of Descartes' um, methodological skepticism. But more importantly for me, I'm not the type of scholar that wholly situates my analysis or my lecture series in theoretical terms, unless that's the point. I always like applying it to very contemporary, very relevant examples to make sense of sort of the nuanced bits of epistemological uh, complexities, right? So the idea is precedence in legal theory serves exactly the same epistemological purpose, right? So what is true of a representative case? If it is truly representative and does not depend on special particularities of its own, something that's too unique to itself, which would exclude generalization, and actually this is not too intro, but hopefully, yeah, you know, it's been a while since I've been back. So you'll have to gauge me and tell me if I'm just jumping in too deep. Hopefully this is, the pacing is not too deep, too quick. There was no ghetto philosophy sort of warm up, I just jumped straight in. Straight in. Um, if it is truly representative and does not depend on special particularities of its own, can legitimately support a general conclusion. Right? So that the idea is, if we're talking about an individual case, and that individual case, that individual precedence, that individual, we can get more abstract and talk about individual conception or conceptual formulation, is, genuine, is genuinely, as he says, representative of more generalized accounts, then we can generalize from that particular instance. So for example, going back to my lecture series on qualitative analysis in terms of uh, pedagogical analysis with participants and academic research and such, we recognize immediately that phenomenolo phenomenological theory didn't just come out of the air, right? It's a combination of many theories, primarily Husserl, but someone sat down, conceptualized um, phenomenological theory as a very, very general, robust conceptual framework, and then that conceptual, robust framework was applied to any multifaceted number, any interdisciplinary number of, of theorist pedagogical work and their research, right? They use phenomenological theory um, as a very abstract, very general articulation of human interaction, um, participant, uh, researcher relationship, what have you, and generalize those points to the point that it applied to anthropologists, historians, um, conflict resolutionists, philosophers, psychologists, blah, 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 blah. Many, many different sociologists, many, many different social scientists use phenomenological research, use phenomenological theory in the very specific instances of their case, right? So we took one generalized account, one specific account of phenomenology, and we generalized that account abroad. Those generalizations were then specified for each individual, right? And this this is not an easy thing to do. This is precisely why I want to include it into the lecture series, because it's very, very easy to go from it's very, very easy to go from all to some. Right? I can't say it's very easy, but it's easy to go from all to some. Right? It's very difficult to go from this to all. Right? This is easy. This is not easy. It's not impossible, but it's not easy, right? There is a, a huge shift, arguably, uh, based on some of the, the latest research that I've been reading, and I haven't gone into it too deep. Those of you who know the scientific method better than I do, I mean, I know it pretty well, but I'm not a practicing hard scientist. I am a practicing social scientist. The scientific method primarily, not exclusively, but primarily is a deductive, a very robustly deductive process, right? begin with the hypotheses, you test, you validate reproducibility, legitimacy, blah, 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 